I wrote to the Geological Survey of Canada, which I got the name uh, Jim Franklin from, actually Rob Kerridge. And Jim wrote me a nice letter back and said, come up and I'll put you in touch with our gold group. And I found out later that um, he'd gone down the corridor to Howard Poulson and Francois Robert of the GSC Gold Group. I think they were the GSC Gold Group. And said, look, this guy is probably about 100 years old because he wrote a very silly paper called Seismic Pumping. But be nice to him for a day or two anyway. And that was amazing. They took me off into the field for a couple of weeks and we toured mines in the Abitibi and further west in the Rainy Lake area. And the evening that I remember was in Fort Francis uh, and we were in a bar drinking beer and watching ice hockey and Francois was drawing a cross-section of Sigma Mine uh, and I was sort of idly following this and I said hang on What's the angle between your flat-lying extension veins and the veins you have on these reverse faults? And he said, oh, it's about 70 degrees. I said, that's, that's curious because that means that those faults are very unfavorably oriented for reactivation. And that means that the only way they will reactivate is if the fluid pressure is lithostatic. And the existence of the extension veins that have opened vertically is telling you that the fluid pressure is lithostatic. Hey, this begins to make sense. It can't be this simple. Though. And we had a wonderful evening sort of thinking about it. And they were drawing pictures of different mines and vein systems. And uh, then we went and looked at them. And Francois had done his PhD on Sigma Mine, and he had made a lot of very acute structural observations, one of which was that there were no consistent cross-cutting relationships between the flat extension veins and the steep veins on the reverse fault. And that was saying, well, we seem to need to have a cyclic process here with the flat veins opening up, and then an episode of slip, offsetting them, and then another episode of flat vein opening, cutting through that fault, and so on. So we became more and more convinced that we were looking at stress cycling and incremental earthquake slip, and that clearly highly overpressured fluids were involved. The Abitibi belt, the erosion level is somewhere around 10 kilometers. I've been told that the metamorphic studies suggest it's remarkably uniform exhumation level. And you see 10 kilometers is getting towards the bottom of the modern seismogenic zone in continental crust. And so we were looking at the transition region, brittle to ductile, around the base of the seismogenic zone. And there was this evidence there for the accumulation and violent release of, episodically, of overpressured fluids. So Francois had figured most of this out, but he didn't know a lot about earthquakes at the time. And uh, what I added was the importance of suddenness rapidly changing the environment during an earthquake. And that not only provided slip, but if you were discharging significant fluid volumes, especially mixed water CO2 fluids, it provided a mechanism for uh, phase separation during pressure reduction. And you, of course, one of the characteristics of these systems, I understand, is extensive um, alteration halos around a lot of the fault veins, especially.
So we got very excited about this and we got it published fairly fast. And some people believe it. Um, and I think I still do. We see variants of valving behavior, which I won't go into detail, but I think this sudden release of overpressured fluid is an important mechanism in mineralization. And it's essentially a magmatic, so it provides a good precipitation mechanism for these very deep vein systems. So what you're mining in a mesozonal low gold system, you're actually mining a nucleation site for earthquake ruptures. That's perhaps fantasy, but I sort of find it interesting.